Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. How good is it to be in church? And so I want to acknowledge those in the room here. It's great to have you. And online, it is great to have you with us, uh, joining us uh, in Melbourne here. And it is going to be a great time, already a great time of worship. And we're going to continue that again afterwards. Um, I want to begin by just telling you a little bit uh, about our home. So a couple of years ago, uh, we actually got some renovations done on our uh, backyard. And so we got some landscaping done. We, we, our home was one of those homes that was flat at the bottom, but then we had one of the steepest backyards. And it ended up just a mud heap and water would flow down almost into our back door when you got too much rain. And so we decided that we'd actually get it leveled out. And who knows that, uh, you know, landscaping like that, it's, it's not cheap to get done. And what we ended up, the finishing touch that got me incredibly excited was fruit trees. Does anyone have fruit trees online in the room? Have we got fruit trees in our backyard? Yes, excellent. So we have a lemon tree, we have an apple tree, we have a plum tree. I've got some little veggie boxes as well. We're growing some strawberries and tomatoes and cucumbers. We've, it, it is my pride and joy. But the ultimate, the one that I love the most is our fig tree. So our fig tree at the moment, and there should be a photo, there's our fig tree up on the screen there, you should see now. There's also, it is producing the best figs right now. So check this out. These are the first in season. Next, look at that. They are, and I've actually got, look, I've got one right here as well. Like, and really they are, oh, they are so juicy. You thought I was going to throw it out to you. I'm not sharing this with anyone. This is good. How, if I can't share with online, how can I share with people in the room? <laughs> Magnificent. So that, they are brilliant. Still waiting for them. But do you know what? The only problem with my fig tree is it's right up the back of my backyard. So I have to go up a set of stairs, off, up another set of stairs off to the side, and then I have to walk right around. And it's, it's too far to bother to go get the fruit. I just leave it to the birds. So I thought the other day, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to chop off one of the branches. I'm going to chop off one of the branches, I'll bring it down to my back door, and then I'll have fresh figs right at my back door, because the figs will obviously keep growing. But to my shock, this is what the, the branch looked like, so if we go to the next, put that next slide up for us, guys. Look how beautiful that was, there's a couple little figs there. I'm thinking in a few days' time, they're going to be nice and juicy, plump, ready to eat. But the next morning, I get up, and look what I find. What's going on? The next day, even worse, this here, five days later, it's a shriveled mess. Now, we're going to pick this up a little bit later. I'm going to come back to this little illustration at the end. Where I want us to jump with, and this is the passage we're going to be spending our time in today, is in John 15. We're going to be looking at the first four verses, and this will actually be a passage of scripture that we'll go back to throughout this series. This is what it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. And today, where I want to go is I actually want to focus in on that fourth verse there, that remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. And out of this passage, the two things that really stick in my mind are the words remain and fruit. Remain and fruit. So when I read here about fruit, I'm thinking of, I don't know if anyone else, there was a Tim Hawkins book where youth ministry people back in the day called Fruit That Will Last. And so I hear the claps over there from youth ministry people, go Proceda. Um, And Fruit That Will Last is is a great book and it talks about the fruit that as we, um, you know, as we do youth ministry well, that there should be fruit that's produced. So it always has me thinking of fruit in other people or fruit of people coming to know Jesus or fruit of God's kingdom being expanded. But as I was preparing for this message and I was thinking about fruit, I was thinking, well, hang on a second. What if this fruit is actually less about what's going on around me and others, but actually what's going on inside me? What if this fruit is, you know, there's another biblical concept that we've got here, the fruit of the Spirit. 
what if it's actually about seeing the fruit of the Spirit being outworked in me? And that there's a connection between remaining in Jesus and seeing the fruit of the Spirit released in my life. So, you know, Galatians 5, 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Isn't that a great list of things? That if we remain in Him, there will be fruit in my life, not of other stuff, but in me, of the outworks of me. Now, here's the challenge. I don't know about you, but me, I I tend to jump to the doing. And so Liz Thong's message last week, I thought was brilliant and reordering us in terms of how we engage with these types of things, because I will go straight to the do and the have. Liz talked to us about this idea that when we were created, we were created that the first initial thing we needed to do was to be, to be in his presence, to be. And from there, we end up doing things because of what, because of that being process, that deep work that God does within us. We then do things and then from the doing, we then have. But how in the fall that things got messed up and we went from that to actually going, well, we have to do first, then I can have, and only then can I be. And so how do we bring that context that Liz spoke about last week to this passage? We don't want to rush straight to the fruit. We need to first of all focus on the remain or the being. And what does this look like? See, we strive, we can strive to have the fruit or if we look at it, the things that Jesus exemplified. Would we agree online in the room that Jesus exemplified the fruits of the Spirit? That we see those things, we see joy, we see peace, we see goodness, we see faithfulness. We strive for the things that Jesus did when he walked on earth without sometimes doing the remaining work or the being work that we're called to do, that deep work. We strive to have a Jesus-like response without having prepared ourselves before facing the test to see it come out. Dallas Willard uh, wrote a book uh, called uh, The Spirit of the Disciplines, and he he discusses this sort of concept, and he uses a baseball illustration. Um, Baseball, not that big in Australia, so I I thought there were some other sporting illustrations that we could use here that would work quite well. First of all, I'm a big cricket fan. I got to go to the day three of the cricket test. Um, Any uh, Indian supporters online or in the room, please leave me alone after the service. No nasty comments in the chat, please. Yes, I know the Melbourne test did not go well for Australia. Um, but there is nothing better than watching a fast bowler, I was a fast bowler, come in and bowl, like Glenn McGrath, the way that he could bowl, that his action was just beautiful, he could drop the ball in the same spot every time, and I could try and emulate Glenn McGrath's action. As a fast bowler, it would be a good thing to do. But is emulating his action and his run-up and the way he releases the ball, is that going to make me a world-class fast bowler? No. There's a whole lot of work behind the scenes that is unseen that he has done through his life to prepare him from that moment of when he releases the ball. Tennis fans. Have we got tennis fans here in the room and online? All right, we've got the Australian Open coming up in a few weeks' time. Roger Federer will be on our shores. He's, oh, you've, oh. I'm not sure if you picked that up online, but my heart's just been broken in that Roger's not coming. This is not fair. I'm broken. I'm going to, I was going to talk about his backhand. Anyone, the single-handed backhand. It is a beautiful thing. But if I work... And, and do this for as long as I can, is that going to make my single-handed backhand any better? It might make it better, but I'm never going to have a backhand of the class of Roger Federer because I haven't done the deep work behind it. I haven't done the weights and the running and the, the time, the, the mental work behind the scenes that he has done to make himself a champion tennis player. And in the same way, we hope that without having done the deep work behind the scenes, that we would have the same response to difficult situations that Jesus did, that the fruits of the Spirit would just happen to come out of us when we maybe haven't done the way, lived to the fullness of the way that Jesus did when he walked. But here's the cool thing, that Jesus did walk the earth and he did give us an example as to how to do this. 
How good's that? It's almost like God had a purpose as to why Jesus came. Yes, to die and be raised again and to restore us into right relationship, but also to show us how to live while we're here. And what I see over and over and over again is Jesus taking time out to be with the Father. Over and over again. At the end of this discussion, Dallas Willard says this. He says, The secret of the easy yoke is simple, actually. It is the intelligent, informed, unyielding resolve to live as Jesus lived in all aspects of his life, not just in the moment of specific choice or action. It is the intelligent, informed, unyielding resolve to live as Jesus lived in all aspects of his life, not just the moment of specific choice or action. Just not in that moment of test, not just in that moment of, I want to respond with joy, or I want to respond with peace, or I want to respond with joyfulness. But it is to respond, it is the work that's done before that moment that's going to allow us to have that right response. It's the being, it's the, God, I'm going to stay in your presence. And Jesus, we see over and over again, he did this. Matthew 4, 1 to 11, is where Jesus heads out to the wilderness and spends 40 days in in fasting and then is actually tempted by the devil. Right in verse 1, this is what Matthew says. He says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, here's an interesting thing is that so often I read this as the wilderness or that 40 days of fasting was that the enemy came to him at his weakest point. Is anyone with me? I, I, I feel that I, I would look at that and go, you know, Jesus, the, that's just like the enemy, to come to Jesus at his weakest. But I was uh, listening to a message by John Mark Comer around this. And he, he pointed this out. He, this word wilderness, when we transit, when its original language is actually the word eremos. This word eremos means wilderness, desert, desolate, or solitary. And it comes up over and again in Jesus' story. And John Mark brings, says this. He says, the eremos, this place of wilderness, isn't a place of weakness. It's a place of strength. After 40 days of silence and solitude, Jesus was at the height of his spiritual powers. Then and only then did he have the strength he needed to take on the devil himself. It was because of the 40 days of, isol- of, of solitude, of silence and of fasting that he had the, the ability that at times spent with the Father to respond in the way that he did. Do you know what he then went and did? The Sermon on the Mount. An incredible message delivered from Jesus. And we then see this pattern. It's not just a once-off. It's not like he did it once then and he was set for the rest of his ministry time. But throughout, over and over and over, we see Jesus returning to this Eremos place. Luke 6, 12, before the calling of the 12 disciples, before he selects those that were going to follow him and carry on his mission. Matthew 4, 20, 14, 23, after the feeding of the 5,000 and before walking on water. Matthew, Mark 1, 35, in the midst of healing people and casting out demons. Mark 6, 31, before feeding the 5,000. Matthew 7, 17, 1 to 9, in the transfiguration, where he has this incredible moment on, on a mountaintop. Matthew, 6, 20, Matthew 26, 36 to 46, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before going to be crucified. He again removes himself and has this Eremos moment. Luke 5 says it like this. I love this. Luke 5, 15 to 16. But the news about him spread even more, and large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. Yet he often withdrew to Eremos places and prayed. He wasn't enamored by the crowds. Yes, the crowds were important because they needed to hear his message. They needed to be healed. They needed to hear about God and, and the truth. But he knew that to do that, he needed time in the Eremos place. And so what does that look like for us? What does the Eremos place look like for us today? So when we talk about this in the context of the spiritual disciplines, this is often referred to to as silence and solitude. Now, for me, I'm an extrovert, right? Silence and solitude is horrible. Like, that sounds just horrible. Delgit, I don't know if throughout our online experience, throughout lockdown, Delgit often talked about that he, would re- he had to resort to hugging uh, light poles. 
I'm sort of in the same boat, right? That, that I missed people. You know, when our family would go on a family walk, my kids would go, you know, to get our exercise. They'd be off on their bikes. My wife would be walking after them. I'd see a neighbour in their front yard and I'd, after 10 minutes, I had to pull myself away and go find them because that's just me. I love people and love talking to people, right? I am an extrovert. I want to be around people. Solitude and silence, it, it, as soon as I hear that, I disengage, right? It, it's not something that I'm like, yes, silence and solitude. Also, in my home, I have three little kids. Silence, any, anyone online in the room, three little kids, where does silence and solitude happen? All right? My poor wife, I feel so sorry for her, Tanya. Like, sometimes the, the kids will be banging on the toilet door, mum, 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 and I'm sitting there right around the corner, but no, for some reason, I can't help them, only mum can. And just there is no silence or solitude. But in the midst of our lives, what does this actually look like? I think it's important, first of all, to define this to get it right, because I recognise that this concept of solitude, especially with the year of 2020 that we've just had, could actually be quite confronting for people. And I want to point out that there is an incredibly important difference between isolation and solitude. Incredibly important difference. See, solitude is by choice with purpose, whereas isolation is enforced upon us. Kerry Newhoff puts it like this, solitude is good. It recharges the soul. It offers time for reflection, for prayer. And even when you're alone, if you're experiencing solitude, you are still connected. Solitude connects you to God, to yourself, and prepares you to be connected to others. Isolation, on the other hand, is never replenishing. It can feel like solitude is the sense that you are alone, but isolation doesn't connect you to anyone. Isolation does what the word suggests. It cuts you off from God, from others, and sometimes even from yourself. Seek solitude. God uses it in powerful ways, but never mistake it for isolation. One gives life, the other steals it. And before I actually go any further, as, as I was driving here tonight, I actually wanted to stop here and pray for people that have felt isolated throughout 2020. And I know that in the midst of, you know, a couple of cases going across Melbourne, that's caused some anxiety to pick up again. And I'd like to stop now to pray for us here in the room, but also those watching online as well. Father, we pray for those that have felt isolated, for those that have felt disconnected, for those that have felt extreme loneliness throughout 2020, and, and there's a fear that's risen up in them, uh, an anxiety that's risen up because of a, a few cases and, and, and what may be going on around us at the moment. And Father, we pray that your peace would come, Father. That your peace would come. That you would break in right now to wherever people are at. And that your peace would come, Father, your love and your joy. Thank you, Father. Psalm 46, uh, 10, it says this, Be still and know that I am God. This psalm tells us there is a kind of knowing that come in silence. And not in words, but the first word, be still, translated, actually means to let go of our grip. Be still, let go of our grip of things and, and know that I am God. Solitude is not a bad thing. It is a good thing. It is a God thing. It is something that we should cherish. But it is not isolation and we cannot confuse the two. The second thing that I'd like to really bring up to, to th think about through this is around technology and silence and solitude. It's very real in, in our world right now that technology robs us a lot of the time of that ability to find silence and solitude. You know, we, we are constantly bombarded with messages all day long. We, we get interrupted by a text message or a notification from Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be coming at us in our hands, in our pockets all the time. There is distraction, digital pollution. You know, there's those moments where we're sitting at our couch watching Netflix while checking the cricket score and chatting to friends on WhatsApp. You know, we, we, there is constant Stuff going on. Where is the room? Where is the margin? Where is the space for silence and solitude to happen in life today with that? 
And this is the thing, sometimes that can feel like rest, but it's actually fake solitude. It can, just because it's quiet, doesn't mean that there's silence. Because there's so much going on in here that there's actually not, we need to actually work on quieting the mind and silencing the mind so that we can allow God to speak and His Spirit to move. So, we want to wind this up. Let me reinforce this again. This message is about be- to be. The whole message is about being. We don't want this to become a doing thing. What I'm not going to be encouraging people to do is, now I want you to go away and take two days apart to have a silent retreat and solitude and you know that's what you need to do to be able to hear from God and set yourself, set yourself up right for the year. We don't want to add more weight to what is already a challenging time and a busy time. The last thing I want you to do is walk away with a to-do list. The whole point is to be in his presence, to be transformed in his presence. And because of that, see the fruit of the Spirit flow out of our lives. So what does it look like for us to remain in him, to be in his presence? Today, what I actually want to leave you with is not a to-do list, but maybe a bit of a to-be list of things that we can do. To be in his presence. What would it look like that we would see that evidence of a transformed life flow out of us? John 15 again, Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. Remain in him. You know, back at the start, I showed you this branch. Now, online, put this in the chat, in the room. It was ridiculous for me to cut this off and expect it to grow figs, wasn't it? Yeah, are we with me? Yeah. It was, it's, it was never going to happen, was it? But sometimes, I think unintentionally, that's where we find ourselves with God. Because of the clutteredness of life around us, because of that digital pollution, because of the things, just the stuff going on around us. To find those spaces, that's Eremos spaces, the wilderness spaces, the silence and the solitude for God to be able to speak into us, it's hard. So as we enter 2021, what are those couple of to-be things that I'd like us to look at? So first of all, if, you'd like, if you're a reader and would like to do some reading, there are a few books and uh, people that I listen to in preparing for this. So John Mark Comer, I referenced earlier, he's written a book called The Ruthless, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and also has some great messages on YouTube around this. If you search John Mark Comer and, uh, and Silence and Solitude, you'll find them, they're very good. Uh, Richard Foster, Celebration of Discipline, is excellent. Uh, Ruth Haley Barton, Invitation to Solitude and Silence, and Dallas Willard, uh, The Spirit of the Disciplines, were all excellent books that I'd recommend if you want to dig more into this, they would do you well. But the two items on the to-be list, first of all, and these are things that I'm going to do, because can I tell you, in preparing this message, I felt incredibly convicted myself. Like, I'm reading, I'm like, oh man, I need to do better at this. And this first one, my wife will be cheering for, (laughs) let me tell you. We need to look at a technology audit as to how is it actually enriching our lives, not taking away from it. We need to stop the death scrolling. (laughs) How do we actually overcome that and allow it to, to bring life, not to steal it, to create, not to take space from us? but that we, we find room that it can actually add value. And so for me, that what that looks like is I'm, I'm actually going to be looking to, well, where is it that I leave my phone in my home so it's not always with me when I'm at home? Because in those moments, that I, I can create space for God, but I find that if my phone's with me, I, I, I can't do that. And it's always pinging, always pinging. So that's one thing I'm going to do. But taking a technology audit, I think, is a great thing that we can do. The second one it actually comes from Richard Foster's book that I mentioned a moment ago called A Celebration of Discipline. And he talks about this, is taking advantage of the little solitudes. 
He says this, these tiny snatches of time are often lost to us. What a pity. They can and should be redeemed. They are time for inner quiet, for reorientating our lives like a compass needle. They are little moments that help us to be genuinely present where we are. What could that look like? It could be like getting up 15 minutes before the family. So that you've got some, some space for solitude before the busyness of the day begins. It could be switching off the car radio when, when we're in the car and having some time on a commute to actually hear from God and allow Him to speak into us. It could be while we're going for a walk, and this is something that I did actually during lockdown and want to do more of throughout the coming years, when I'm going for a walk, not having the earbuds in with music going all the time, but actually leaving it nothing there so I can actually hear God's creation around me and be inspired by that and allow His Spirit to do a deep work in me in the context of that. Really what I want us to be thinking about is how are we building healthy rhythms of this for 2021? Those little solitude moments, setting up to technology to actually serve us rather than we be um, it serving us rather than us serving it. How are we creating margin for God to be speaking and for us to be hearing and listening and resting in that? Not creating anxiety, not another to-do list, but to be, to be in his presence and to be transformed in his presence and see the fruit of the Spirit outworked because of that. You know, right now we're going to have an opportunity for a little solitude. Online, in the room, we're actually going to be going back into worship again. But before we go back into worship, what I want to do is, is we've got the creative team up here, and in a moment they're going to play again. But before we get to that, we're going to have a minute's silence to see what God's Spirit might do right now. And online, I'm believing that wherever you're watching right now, that God is going to do something. That His Spirit will be at work in your home, in your car, wherever it might be that you are. In the room, right now, that God's Spirit would be at work and that He's going to do deep work, even in the minute as we lead into worship. I'm going to read a quote and we'll go. We are starved for quiet. To hear the sound of sheer silence, that is the presence of God himself. Thank you, Lord. So I'll stand to worship. I'll go to Brazil. I'll get it.
this night.